1969 by the chaplain of the United States Senate. And he said, We thank thee, O God, that the freedom we celebrate in coming days is not an attainment, but an obtainment, that it is thy precious gift to man as part of his createdness. We thank thee for the daring of our forefathers in reclaiming their ancient rights. We thank thee, too, for the hero's valor, the patriot's devotion, the prophet's vision, and for all the blood and sweat and toil by which our freedom was purchased. As we commemorate our national independence, accept again the declaration of our everlasting dependence upon thee. In all our joy and thanksgiving, enable us to remain a nation under God, and give us grace and goodness to minister to mankind in his name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. All right, the next item of business we have this evening, we have announcements of upcoming city events, and who has that duty this evening? Mr. James. Uh, just to let folks know, tomorrow, Wednesday, July 12th, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is having a blood drive from 8 to noon uh, out in front of Building 3 over here. Tuesday, July 18th, the Chamber has their monthly luncheon. That's at 11.30 at the Civic Center. Our next council meeting is Tuesday, July 25th, again, 6 p.m. here. Uh, reminder that for council, Friday, July 28th, we have the budget retreat. That's 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Fairfield Inn and Suites, 5808 Corridor Loop. And then finally, uh, filing for Shirt City Council election starts Monday, July 24th. Uh, so again, we're going to be holding a general election on November 7th. Uh, for the purposes of electing council members to places three, four, five for three-year terms uh, from November 2017 to 2020. And again, uh, you can check with the city secretary's office for our council packet. Very good. Thank you, sir. Next on the agenda this evening, announcements and recognitions by the city manager. Mr. Kessel. Mr. Mayor, city council, I uh, wanted to recognize the public affairs department uh, and particularly uh, Linda and Mary uh, and Natalie uh, for their work with the, uh, the the 4th of July Jubilee. And I think they're going to cover some items, so I'm going to try not to steal their thunder. We received an, an email, though, that I wanted to read a little bit of. It was from the Port of San Antonio, which is celebrating the 100 years of Kelly Field. Um, and their events manager writes uh, that they wanted to commend uh, the city of Church and the team for one of the best small town parades that I have ever had the privilege of participating in. Little did we know what a grand reception we would receive. I am the event manager and I know how involved it is to put on an event as yours, not to mention to get volunteers to help the day of the event. The number of units you had and the ease with which they blended at the starting point was commendable. There were spectators from beginning to end at least three to five deep and in some places more. There was not a blank spot along the parade route. Again, congratulations on a job well done. I think that says everything about uh, the parade and, and what also occurred uh, at the Jubilee uh, this year. So congratulations to the public affairs team and all of the city staff that uh, helped make that happen. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a few new employees to recognize this evening. Uh, first up, we have from EMS uh, Paramedics, um, and if I say your name improperly, please correct me when you get up here, uh, Cody Doan and James Mangrum. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. 
Tonight we have, uh, like you said, Cody Doan and James Mangrum, both recently just started with us. We'll go with Cody first. He grew up in Kansas and started his EMS life about eight years ago as an EMT and then quickly moved up to licensed paramedic. He moved to Idaho and worked there for four years as a medic, then moved to Maryland and played as a stay-at-home parent. Um, then they moved here and he decided to come work for us. He has one wife, one kid, and two dogs, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Very good. Um, next is James. James has been in the field for about eight years as well, starting in 2008 in Mobile, Alabama. James graduated from the EMT program at the University of South Alabama, where he continued on for his paramedic and bachelor's of science in EMS. There he worked for Mobile County EMS until his graduation and moved to Denver, Colorado. In Denver, James worked for Rural Metro, serving the city of Aurora. Here, James met his wife of four years, Ivana, who convinced him to move to San Antonio in an effort of pursuing both their higher education. James is appreciative of the opportunity to work for the city of Shirts and looks forward to providing excellent care to the people which he serves. Very good. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us. And uh, before you walk away, I, I, I offer each of you a chance at the microphone if you wish. It's certainly not required. Uh, don't feel bad if you don't want to step up, but if you'd like to say anything, feel free. Pass. <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, we're, both, uh, we're happy to have both of you on with us and hope that you'll be with us for a long time. Thanks for joining the team. Very good. All right, from our HR team, we have HR generalist Lovey Smith. Good evening. Council. I am very pleased to be here tonight to introduce our new HR journalist, Lovey Smith. Ms. Smith comes to us from Virginia. Um, she has been in the HR field for more than 10 years, most recently in the healthcare industry, but she also has extensive experience working with federal contractors. Um, we are so thrilled. She, she's been here about a month. She jumped right in. I have received such great positive feedback from many of our departments already. So like I said, we are so very thrilled to have Lovey here with us tonight. And I will turn it over to her if she wants to say anything. No? no? Okay. All right. Well, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us and hope you'll be with us for a long time. Thank you. And then uh, engineering. I have a project manager joining us, uh, Scott McClelland. I'm sorry, McClelland. Very good. Mayor, Council, Mr. Kessel. I'm extremely excited to be here again. It's the first time um, in a long time that engineering has been fully staffed. Not to say we still don't need more help, but we're finally making use of the positions that, that you've all uh, authorized for us. So we have Scott McClellan, who came on June 12th. He is from Denver, Colorado, and um, he has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Colorado in Denver and an associates in construction supervision. And um, he worked for a consulting firm out there for about four, four or five years, um, working a lot with municipalities and helping them out from um, the consulting side. So he's got a lot of very pertinent experience. Um, he's married. Uh, his wife was helpful in getting him here. She's from Austin, so he does have a, a somewhat local connection. Uh, he's, they have an eight-month son, eight-month-old son, so we're excited to um, get to know that little guy. And um, woodworking is his uh, hobby. Very cool. Um, opportunity at the microphone? Happy to be here. Excited to, to make uh, be as helpful as I can. Wonderful. We're very glad to have you on the team and look forward to you being with us for quite some time. Thanks for joining us. All right, the next item that we have on the agenda this evening, we have a hearing of residents, and uh, first up uh, this evening is uh, Mr. Eric White. Mr. White. Thank you for listening to him. Let me speak. Uh, I'm here to, uh, on John Kessel. I feel like he's done his outstanding job since he's been here. 
He's always helped me with everything I've called on him to do. But he gets blamed with a lot of things that I don't think is fair that he's not responsible for. So we need to be careful about blaming him with some things that it's uh, not his fault. And I think uh, there's several more to speak on this, and I'll let that go as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Next up this evening, I have Maggie Titterington. Maggie. Good evening. Maggie Titterington, 10217 Ivy Horn. Um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of a couple of businesses here. Um, I have a couple of letters to read. Uh, the first one is from Olaf Emblem with SurePoint Self Storage. SurePoint Self Storage has been open for business and shirts since 2006. In 2014, we opened SurePoint 1103. In the past, it was often difficult, if not impossible, to work with the city. I have been very vocal about the issues we were facing, and nothing ever seemed to get done. That all changed when John Kessel took over as our city manager. Mr. Mr. Kessel arranged a meeting with us and city staff to see if the issues could be resolved. The biggest issue we had was obtaining certificates of occupancy. While working with Mr. Kessel, we began, to be, we began to better understand the problem. It was not because staff did not want to work with us, but rather they were, in my opinion, extremely understaffed. Mr. Kessel put a plan in place that has worked not only for us, but the city as well. I was pretty clear from the beginning that I believe the need for our tenants to get a CFO was unfair, expensive, and very difficult to obtain. Working with Mr. Kessel helped us to understand why it was necessary and why it really wasn't that expensive when considering all factors. We are still required to obtain the CFO, but the tenant is required to pay the fee, but the process is so seamless now that we no longer have the same issues. We took over what was then 3009 self-storage in June of 2010. I have been witness to the old way of doing things, and I can tell you as a business community, we are in a much better position than we were when we started. I would like to thank those council members who are willing to speak to me by phone or in person. On behalf of SurePoint Self Storage, I would like to offer my support for Mr. Kessel and would encourage the city council to do the right thing, allow our city manager to continue doing great things for this community. In my last letter, I'm reading fast, I don't see the thing going off. As a small business shirts owner and chamber president for over seven years, I've had the honor of working with various city council members, mayors, and leaders within our city departments. I have seen an increase in business community and quality of life happen that is due to the diligence of not just one, but many. But as we are, as a team, excellent, it is because we have leadership that shows us what excellence is. Since his tenure as our city manager began, Mr. Kessel has committed not only himself, but also his staff to making our city better, more transparent, and prosperous. He set a goal and achieved a reserve fund in less than the five years he had put before us. He has maintained and excelled in his relationships with other cities so that partnerships and communications continues to grow. He has also not only listened to the concerns and needs of our businesses, but also residents, and has the hard task of balancing between the needs of quality of life and what we need to move to the next level as a city and community. Last, as a Shirts resident off and on for over 44 years, I have seen a lot of changes in our city, most that I am proud. I have access to those within the city that help me with my quality of life, I have a transparency to our yearly budget through meetings that I can ask the questions and understand and get answers. I have sidewalks, parks, and festivals that truly make me a proud Shirts hometown girl. The most excellent thing we can do continuing to ensure the careful growth of our city and the protection of its best interests is to continue with the leadership we have in place, and that is retaining Mr. Kessel as our city manager. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, I have uh, Roy Richard. Things have changed a lot in our little community of shirts over the course of the last few years. Um, I remember in, in the 50s when I used to ride my bike up to Old Vossie and get a soda water or hamburger or something. But one thing that hasn't changed in our community is people still talk. Still rumors abound. Apparently one came across my uh, listening range a few weeks ago indicating that there were several of our newly elected council members that feel it's in the best interest of the city to terminate the services of our city manager. I was very perplexed by this. We've never been financially better off, never been physically stronger. People are trying to, hot, we're trying to come to work for the city. Uh, businesses are coming into the town. 
I didn't understand. I don't understand. I can't understand why anyone would contemplate a decision. This man is the real deal. I've been here the better part of 60 years as a resident. I've seen city managers come and city managers go. He's as good as we have ever had here, as good as we have ever had here. And to contemplate terminating his services is beyond belief, in my view. I mean, there is no upside potential to this, and there could be cataclysmic effects. I don't know if you've given any thought to this, but you don't go and pick a city manager off the city manager tree. They don't grow on trees. Good city managers like John Kessel are like hen's teeth. They are extremely rare. And once you get one, you best hold on to them for as long as you possibly can. Because I can guarantee you, he leaves, we'll be back in the wilderness for another five or six years looking for his replacement. And there, again, you're not going to do any better than him. And I don't know, I quite frankly cannot understand why this is even being considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. All right, the next item I have on the agenda this evening is a workshop update and discussion on City of Shirts Water and Wastewater Rate Plan, Wastewater Rate Plan, easy for me to say, uh, by Wilden and, and uh, at Economist and Economist.com. Mr. Waite. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan Jackson um, from Will Dan. Um, for those who have been on Council for a while, you've seen his face a number of times. He's been doing our, our water and wastewater rate studies for a number of years now. He's also contracted with SSLGC and Cibolo Creek Municipal Authority and does their plans as well, as well as the City of Seguin, our partner in SSLGC. And he's going to come and give a presentation tonight for the, for the newer members who may not have met Mr. Jackson yet um, I, I, when we were doing the orientation and talking a little bit about water and rates and things. I, I explained to you that you would have some time to, um, where you'd get to listen to him and get to know him. Um, he's prepared to answer questions um, and, and, and to present tonight um, where we are and, and, and what we're looking at for next year as well as what the future holds for up to five years out. So I'll turn it over to him and let him get started. Well, good evening and welcome back. Thank you very much. Right there. Thank you very much, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, my name is Dan Jackson, Vice President of Will Dan Financial Services, uh, formerly known as Economist.com. Uh, I appreciate the chance to be before you here tonight. Uh, it's always a privilege to come here to the City of Shirts and to talk to you about a subject matter that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but it is a subject matter that all cities are, are wrestling with these days, and that is the increasing cost of water and sewer service, both here in the state of Texas and throughout the United States. Um, as Mr. Wade indicated, I've had the privilege of being the city's rate consultant for the last several years, and I have assisted you as a council and your city staff in making some very difficult decisions, decisions that have had to be made, but decisions that have really paid off, as you're going to see tonight. Um, it's never easy to talk about water and wastewater rates. It's never easy to talk to even contemplate the idea of asking rate, rate payers to pay more for anything at any time for any reason. But here in the 21st century, we have to recognize a couple of factors that are taking place. And one factor is the cost of water service is going up. And how cities recognize that and how cities deal with that are going to be critical to the future of you as a community. Um, I always, whenever I talk about rates, either before the city of Shirts or any other city, I always like to start off by talking a little bit about what's going on in the industry. Because what happens in the industry impacts you as a community and impacts your water and wastewater resident customers. For example, across the United States, the average utility has been increasing its rates 5 to 6 percent every year. Costs of water all across the United States are going up. As a matter of fact, the American Water Works Association has indicated that it expects water and wastewater rates across the America to triple in the next 15 years. Now, why is that? Why is it going up? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, you try to operate your water and sewer utility like a business. 
You want the revenues from your water and wastewater rates to cover all the costs of providing that service. And when costs, those costs go up, you have no choice but to pass those costs through to your ratepayers. Well, think about it. Cost of everything goes up by 3% a year just due to inflation. But when you look at water and sewer service in particular, there are a lot of factors that are causing water and wastewater rates to go up at even higher levels. And, and these are factors that are simply beyond a city's ability to influence. For example, water and sewer systems are very expensive to build. They're expensive to maintain. It costs a lot of money to put those lines in the ground, to build those above ground storage tanks. And like any asset, they wear out over time. You have to continually invest in those assets to ensure that they continue to provide service at a quality that your residents are used to. Well, that money has to come from somewhere. Government regulations have made the cost of building assets even more expensive in the last 20 years. Um, cost of electricity, chemicals, all of those go up. Cost of insurance goes up. You know what, health care is, is something that we're all concerned about. We're concerned about it as residents. We're concerned about it as families. When health care costs go up, your family budget goes up, but your water costs go up too because you have to pay health care costs to your employees. So for a lot of reasons that are simply beyond your control, water costs are continuing to go up. The successful utility is a utility that recognizes this and manages, manages these cost increases in a way that gets you the revenue you need while at the same time minimizes the impact on your ratepayers. In, in, in summary, water costs are going to be higher for everybody as we continue to move on in the 21st century. Okay, that's what's happening in the industry in general. Let's now turn to the city of Schertz in particular. Um, you may recall that in 2015 we prepared our last comprehensive water and wastewater rate study for the city. In that study, we forecast your rates for, the, uh, for a 10-year period. As a result of that, you implemented rates for the 2015, and then you asked us to come back and do annual updates uh, for the years after that. Well, in 2016, a lot of factors changed that were not advantageous to the city. For example, your main supplier of water service is SSLGC, the Schertz Seguin Local Government Corporation. Well, their costs ended up going up significantly in 2016 because one of their major customers, SAWS, decided to stop buying what we call Tier 2 water. They decided they were buying 2,000 acre feet of Tier 2 water and they announced in 2016 they were going to stop buying water. Well, when that happens, your costs for everybody else go up at a much greater rate. Secondly, um, there was a, a negotiation between the cities of Schertz and Seguin about the new Guadalupe well field. And as a result of those negotiations, the city of Schertz assumed all the debt costs for the Guadalupe well field. That increased your costs also. And finally, the city revised its long-term capital improvement plan, and that increased your costs as well. So we came back in 2016 and we said, look, you're going to need larger increases in 2016 and 2017. So we implemented about, an, an, if I recall correctly, about a 9 to 11% increase last year. And the forecast was that your rate increase for this year would be in that same particular range. Well, 2017 came along and the, condition, the situation got a lot better. This is sort of why you do these annual updates, because all rate plans, all financial plans are based on forecasts of what's going to happen in the future. And well, you know, I can't, nobody can tell the future with perfect accuracy. All you can do is make predictions based on a series of reasonable assumptions. And when circumstances change, the properly managed city adapts accordingly. Well, 2017 resulted in some future, further changes, most of which have really benefited the city of Schertz. For example, SAWS came back and said, well, maybe we're going to keep buying water after all. Um, yeah, we said we were going to go from 2,000 acre feet to zero, but I think we're going to buy 1,000 acre feet. So that really helped. And uh, that means that SAWS is going to continue to pick up a greater share of SSLGC costs. Secondly, the Guadalupe project has now been moved back to the year 2021. It was originally anticipated to be online in the 2018-2019 time frame. Well, it's been moved back a couple of years, and that benefits your rate plan also because it means you can phase in your rate adjustments over a longer period of time. And I don't want to get into too much detail, but a third aspect was that SSLGC de decided to eliminate what they call the risk premium. 
That risk premium would have been beneficial had the Guadalupe field had more customers to it, but with only Shirts as a customer, it actually was, uh, was a detriment to the city of Shirts. SSLGC has eliminated that. That is benefiting your costs as well. Another thing um, that a well-managed city does is when it, when it recognizes that its costs are going up and its rates have to go up, it goes back in and adjusts its budget accordingly. The city staff went back in, adjusted its 2018 budget, and the 2018 budget is now below where it was originally forecast to be. If your budget is not as high, your rate adjustments don't have to be high, as high. And finally, the city has scaled back its CIP, purchase, its CIP estimates or its capital improvement spending estimates. So the bottom line is that based on all these adjustments that were made in 2017, we are still going to recommend that you implement a rate adjustment, but the rate adjustment is going to be significantly less than what it was forecast to be last year. I mean, the bad news is your rates have to go up this year. The good news is they're going to go up a lot less than what was originally anticipated. Okay, let's just give a little bit of background uh, on your system, uh, particularly for those of you who are new to the council. The city has a water and wastewater rate structure whereby it charges its customers two types of uh, rates. It charges a monthly minimum charge and it charges a volume rate for every thousand gallons of water that is purchased. Your monthly minimum charge is dependent on the size of the meter you have. The larger the meter you have, the larger your minimum charge. You start out, most of your customers have a 5 8 inch meter. That's a pretty standard residential meter. They pay a, a, a rate or a minimum charge of $23.19 per month. If you're outside the city limit, you pay a premium, which is typical. The vast majority of cities across the United States have a rate structure in place where outside city customers pay higher rates than inside city customers. And of course, if you have a larger meter, you have a larger rate uh, monthly charge accordingly. You also pay a volumetric rate based on the number of thousand gallons you use. The more gallons you use, the higher your volumetric rate is. It starts out at $2.86 per thousand gallons for the first 6,000 gallons, and then between six and 9,000 it goes to 291, and then it goes up in higher increments. This is meant to encourage water conservation. The more you use, the more you pay. At the same time, your lowest income and fixed income people who typically, although not always, typically are your lowest volume users, pay the lowest rate. Inverted block rates, and that's what these are called, are very popular rate designs throughout the state of Texas. They're very effective both in encouraging the conservation of water and ensuring that low income people pay the minimal amount for water service. This is your current wastewater rate structure. Like water rates, you pay a base charge and a volumetric charge. Most of your residential customers pay a base charge of $11.16, and they pay a line maintenance fee of $0.44 cents per thousand gallons, and then they pay a user charge that reimburses your water treatment supplier, um, CCMA, for their rate of $3.35. Now, this is a lot of numbers. A lot of people say, well, this is all well and good, but how much do I actually pay each month for service? <coughs> well. Your average rate payer in the city of Shirts uses about 10,000 gallons of water service in, uh, a month, and they use about 5,000 gallons of wastewater service a month. Now, of course, some people use more and some people use less, but the average is about 10,000 gallons. So what many cities like to do is they like to see how that monthly charge compares to other neighboring cities. Well, if you're in the city of Shirts and you use 10,000 gallons of water and 5,000 gallons of wastewater, you're paying about $82.34 a month for that service. This chart compares you to many of your neighboring communities. As you can see, your rates are right about where you expect them to be. You're higher than some communities, and you're lower than other communities. You are a little higher than New Braunfels and Georgetown. Um, you're about the same as San Antonio and Round Rock. You're actually about $5 below the state average and you're significantly less than certain other cities like Seguin, San Marcos, and Bernie. Now, when you look at rate comparisons, keep one very important thing in mind. 30% of water and wastewater utilities across the United States right now charge rates that do not cover their costs. In other words, they're charging rates at, uh, at they are subsidizing their rates from their general fund. So yeah, their rates are lower, but it also means that they're using some general fund tax revenue to support their rates. So just because another city's rates are lower than yours 
does not necessarily mean that their costs are lower. It doesn't necessarily mean that they run a more efficient system or anything like that. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind when you do rate comparisons. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through some of these charts rather, relatively quickly because I know you've got a long agenda tonight. You have at present about 13,825 water accounts. You've been growing at a rate of about 200 accounts per year. Well, our latest forecast assumes that you're going to continue to grow at that same pace, about 200 to 250 accounts per year. This chart right here is a really interesting chart to guys like me who are water guys. What it does is it kind of shows how people are using water here in the city of Schertz. In the, last, in the, in the fiscal year 2017, it's estimated that you're going to sell about 1.5 billion gallons of water. 75% of your water usage is your 5 8 inch meters. To no great surprise, you are overwhelmingly a residential community, so the vast majority of your usage is residential. But you do have a smattering of usage from your higher volume uh, or higher uh, meters, which are mostly commercial. Um, water consumption is very difficult to predict because water consumption is based on the weather. Well, what's the weather going to be like next week? I don't think anybody knows. What's the weather going to be like next year? Well, if a, if a weatherman can't predict what the weather is going to be like next week, how in the heck is he going to be able to predict what it's like next year? So when you do long-term forecasting, you generally assume that weather is going to be an average year. Look at how your water usage has varied over the last five years. In 2012 and 2013, you, had, you were selling a, uh, more water. Your water usage dipped a little bit in 2015 and 2016 because those were pretty wet years. And it's come back a little bit here in 2017. And we're forecasting that it's going to slowly climb over the next uh, 10 years. As you grow as a city, you're going to sell a little bit more water. How are you, where is the water going to come from? Well, you buy your water from SSLGC. Right now, you buy it all from the Gonzales watershed. Well, when the Guadalupe watershed comes online, you're going to be buying less water from Gonzales and more water from Guadalupe. This is going to have an impact on your costs. How is it going to impact your costs? Well, the Guadalupe field is going to be a little bit more expensive than the Gonzales water field. However, the more you buy from Guadalupe, the less you buy from Gonzales, and you can offset your costs a little bit. This chart right here forecasts your costs from the Gonzales watershed, and I apologize for misspelling Gonzales. Uh, I know how it's spelled, I just didn't get it right. Um, as you can see here, in the year 2018, you're forecast to spend about $5.2 million on the Gonzales watershed. You're starting to pay debt service for the construction costs of the Guadalupe field. So as you can see, you're paying about $780,000 in debt service for Guadalupe. The debt service for Guadalupe is going to go up up until about the year 2021 when the, water, when, the, when the Guadalupe field comes online. But look what happens in 2022, the first year of Guadalupe's operation. Your Guadalupe costs are going to go up because of the operating costs, but your Gonzales costs are going to come down. So what I think the city staff has done is a very good job of offsetting the cost increases of Gonzales, of Guadalupe, with the cost decreases of Guadalupe. Look, whenever you, whenever you develop a new water resource, your costs are going to go up. So the challenge you face is to minimize it to the best extent possible. And I think the combination of staff work and SSLGC work and your partners in Seguin have helped you minimize your cost increases in the coming years. Okay, one other thing I do want to keep in, uh, keep in mind is that when you do long-term forecasting, you also have to assume the amount of debt you're going to issue to fund capital improvements. Well, it can be kind of difficult to project exactly how much you're going to do in capital improvements. Last year, uh, staff was projecting about $30 million in capital improvements. This year, we're revising it downward a little bit to about $20 million. Who know, you know, maybe you never really know. Maybe next year it might go back up a little bit. We just don't know. But we're building the rate plan right now to assume that you're going to need to fund about $20 million in capital improvements. This chart right here, I'm just skipping ahead to page uh, 16 in the interest of time. This chart right here shows what our forecast was last year for your total cost of service, which is the blue line, and this year what your total cost of service is. Your cost of service has gone down relative to where we thought it would be last year. 
And that's a very good thing because it means that the magnitude of your rate adjustments can now be minimized. So let's cut to the chase. Let's talk about the rate plan. What we are going to recommend that the city do, we are going to recommend that the city adopt a one-year rate plan to be effective in October of 2017, the beginning of your next fiscal year. This is the rate plan as it pertains to your water customers and your wastewater customers. As you can see, we're recommending that you do the following. We're recommending that you adjust your, uh, your base charge for your 5 8 inch customers from $23.19 to $23.89, effective October 1st. We recommend about a 6 to 10 cent across the board increase in your, um, in your volumetric rate per thousand gallons. It's a little higher for the high volumes, a little lower for the low volumes, but it's about a 6 to 10 percent adjustment. For those of you who like to talk about it in terms of percentage, that's about a 3 percent adjustment. On the wastewater side, we're recommending about a 4 to 5 percent adjustment. We recommend taking the base charge from $11.16 to 11.72. We recommend taking your line maintenance fee from 44 cents to 46 cents. And the usage charge is a pass through from SSL uh, from CCMA which is going to go up from $3.35 to $3.58. Now, the next 4 years represent our forecast of where we think your costs are going to be, but we strongly recommend that you continue to do annual updates. Because if, you, if, for example, it's a very wet year this year and your usage goes down, you might need to adjust your rates up a little bit next year. If your, costs, um, if, your costs, uh, if your capital improvement costs need to go up next year, we might need to tweak the plan a little bit. We're only talking about tweaking in terms of a percent or two. I think that while these numbers need to be checked every year, I think that this is a pretty good estimate of where your costs are going to be. As you can see, you're looking at about 3 to 5 percent annual adjustments for each of the next four years. So what does that mean in terms of what, your, what, what, your, what is the impact is going to be on your average rate payer? Well, if you're a, if you're a user of 5,000 gallons of water and 5,000 gallons of wastewater, right now you pay $67.60. Under this plan, your bill would go up by $2.94 a month to $70.54. If you're a 10,000-gallon user, right now your monthly bill is $82.34. Under this plan, your bill would go up by $3.38 to $85.72. Since the average customer, residential customer, uses 10,000 gallons of water a month, what that really means is about 70% of your water bills are going to be 10,000 gallons or less. That's just arithmetic. I mean, you have higher volume users, unquestionably. Unquestionably, you do. But you have relatively few of them compared to the large number of uh, customers that use 10,000 gallons or less. So many people like to try to take these very complicated financial and rate plans and try to summarize them in terms of one or two numbers. Well, I don't like to do that because these plans are very complicated. But if I did, I would say that the impact of this plan is that most of your ratepayers would see a two to three dollar a month increase in their monthly bill as a result of this plan in the first year. As you can see in subsequent years, we're probably looking at similar adjustments, probably about two to three dollars a month each year for the next four to five years. The good news is that's less than where we thought it would be. We thought your bill for a, for a 5,000 gallon user would have to go from $67 to $74 this year. It's only going, it only has to go to $70.54. You can thank SAWS and you can thank your city staff for its prudent budget management. Uh, uh, and you can thank the fact that you're selling a little bit more water this year. All of those factors have gone into the fact that you can lower the rate adjustment nece uh, necessary to meet your future needs. I can assure you that your rates are going to need to keep going up in the future. And they're going to have to go up for reasons, many of which are beyond your control. SSLGC is going to continue to increase their costs in the future years because their costs are going to keep going up. CCMA is going to continue to increase their wastewater rates because their costs are going up. Cost of everything is going to go up by 3%, and that's going to be passed through. But keep this in mind. You run a nonprofit utility. So all you're asking your ratepayers to do is pay you what it is costing you to provide that service. 
You're, uh, you're not in this to make money. You're not in it to, to make a profit. You don't have stockholders. You don't pay dividends. Nothing of that nature. All you're trying to do is recover your costs. And like every other utility in the United States, your costs are going to continue to go up. And the key is to implement a long-term financial plan that assures that you get the revenue you need to continue to provide a high quality of service while at the same time minimizing any adjustments on your ratepayers. I'm to my last slide. Um, I do really want to compliment your city staff. I think you've done a great job in managing your costs, in minimizing your budget increases, because that's really an important part of any long-term rate plan. The plan will, if implemented, will continue to enable your water and wastewater utility to be financially independent, it'll enable it to be self-sufficient, and it will enable it to continue to provide a high level of service. Some utilities have, a, have, a, um, have as their objective trying to keep rates as low as possible. No rate increases. We don't ever want our costs to go up. They do that by not doing the capital improvements that are necessary to ensure that your system is operating properly. So what happens is they have low rates, but they also have a system that's falling apart. You have made the difficult decision in the past that you weren't going to do that that you are going to continue to invest in your system to assure a good quality of service. This plan enables you to continue to do, do so. And finally, we do recommend that you continue, that you adopt the one rate, the one year plan and continue to look at this on an annual basis. Because as circumstances change, you need to adopt your plan accordingly. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Very good. Thank you, sir. And, and good news that we don't have to raise uh, uh, rates as much as we thought we would have to. It uh, mm -hmm. doesn't get much better than that. Council, questions uh, this evening? I think when you have news like that, there may not be a need for questions. So <laughs> it appears that there are none. Thank you for presenting to us and um, look forward to seeing you again next year. Maybe we can have a repeat. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. It does look like we have the uh, uh, um, fans going now, so I apologize for the heat. Uh, hopefully we'll continue to lower the temperature as we go. All right, the next item we have on the agenda this evening, we have the consent agenda. The first item there is the minutes, and that is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 27, 2017. Item number two, excuse council absences, approval of the absence of Mayor Pro Tem Edwards from the City Council meeting of June 27, 2017. Item number three, resolution 17R46, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the approval of the Bear Metro 911 budget for fiscal year 2018 and other matters in connection therewith. Item number four, ordinance 17S20, final reading, an ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, amending the comprehensive land plan by changing certain certain land areas to single family residential designation and certain land areas to commercial campus designation on the future land use plan. Item number five, boards, commissions, and committee member appointments. Approval of the appointment of Mr. Charles Cornelis as an alter alternate member to the Transportation Safety Advisory Committee. Councilor, are any of these that uh, anyone feels need to be pulled and handled individually? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the items on consent? Move. Second. Have a motion from Mr. Thompson. I have a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Of discussion items, item number one, ordinance 17S21, amending the master thoroughfare plan of the city of Schertz, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance, providing an effective date and other matters in connection therewith. Good evening, Ms. Woodley. Um, my understanding is this is um, not on consent agenda because it was not a unanimous vote um, last week. I do have the same presentation. I have a copy of the proposed thoroughfare plan if you'd like me to pull it up. Uh, otherwise, I will accept questions or provide any, any um, comments that, that you would like. Very good. Council, questions for uh, Ms. Woodley. Move that we adopt ordinance number 17-S-21. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson, a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from council? Being none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Item number seven, resolution 17R47, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing agreement for provisions of professional services between the City of Shirts and the City of Shirts Economic Development Corporation and other matters in connection therewith. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so I'm, I'm 
Coming forward today, uh, on behalf of the, the EDC uh, operation, uh, they receive the services by the City of Shirts through a service agreement, uh, and that's what we have provided to you. The service agreement provides for all administrative functions that are provided by the City of Shirts to the Economic Development Corporation, which is a separate entity. Uh, this is the second year that we have this service agreement in place. Uh, for the current or for the future 2017-18 fiscal year, it will be $441,395, which is a 2.5% increase. Uh, we've included the uh, service agreement. Are there any questions that you have? Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Kenneth Hedder? Mr. Crawford. Correct me if I misread in this document. Uh, this includes all the fees for the administrative part of uh, SEDC, including the attorney fees. Is that correct? So you are correct. Uh, this, uh, what the agreement goes through and, and sets out, it, it identifies all of those fixed costs that are, are set to a specific dollar amount. That does include staff, um, our, our salaries. That includes some of the services that we receive through the city, for example, uh, use of, of the finance department as they run our financials. Uh, there are a couple of, of expenses in there that are, are variable, so to speak, and our attorney fees are all under that category. Um, and so what we have included in the agreement is that we receive, that the EDC will receive those services at the rate that the city has pre-negotiated. Um, and so that, along with the copier, and there's a couple of other expenses like that that are still, still variable. Probably not for you, but maybe for Mr. James or Mr. Mr. Walters, rather. Do we have any comparison point for the city staff expenses for the same kinds of things to get a feel for what the city spending not counting what the city's recouping from EDC, as just, as, just as a comparison point. EDC versus the city. Dollar-wise, percentage-wise, some kind of a, a scaling to see. Uh, we have not, I don't believe we've run that sort of city-wide. Again, we, with the budget, the city's budget, we charge certain accounts for those types of services. So one of the charges for the water fund goes to uh, office space and staff support and things like that. But we've not kind of run it out citywide, I don't believe, and broken it down on some percentage basis. My, my question really is, if you took the same 13 items listed in, in the appendix here for this uh, re uh, resolution and compared that, uh, took those 13 items for what the city staff side, which would be everything except EDC, what, would you have any kind of so, dealing with the, what those percentages would be compared to the city versus CDC. Uh, no, we don't have that. The majority okay. of the costs, um, all but about 50000 is purely the EDC employees' salaries and then items like uh, rent and financial services, HR services, and the cleaning staff rolls into that final 50000 uh, that was set a year prior to that. EDC is what, three people? As a staff, four? That's like $100,000 admin expense for each employee then it's on, re on recouping. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to understand a feel for what EDC expenses are versus what the city equivalent expenses would be. And if you don't have it, that's okay. I just wondered if you did. No, I'm sorry. They don't have that. In okay. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, is Move that we adopt resolution number 17-R47. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson, a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Next item that we have on the agenda this evening is Resolution 17R48. Resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing an interlocal agreement with the Shirts Cibolo Universal City Independent School District for EMS services and other matters in connection therewith. Mr. Mavic, good evening. Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, this is an agreement with the city and the district uh, for EMS services. We've had a long-standing uh, uh, relationship with the district for uh, several things we do, football games, uh, first aid, CPR. Um, we felt it was time to, to 
make the make it official, though. I'm available for any questions that you have. Very good. Any questions for Mr. Mabbitt? Move that we adopt resolution number 17 R48. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson, a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Thank you, sir. Next item we have on the agenda is item number nine, ordinance 17 S23, an ordinance by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, amending the official zoning map by rezoning approximately 12 acres of land from apartment multifamily residential R4 to planned development district or PDD. Uh, this is on uh, the agenda for public hearing, so we'll have a presentation from staff first. After staff has completed their presentation, I'll open it up to the public for anybody who would like to comment on this particular item. Uh, and uh, if you would, when you come forward, if you give your name and address for the record, uh, we ask that you try to keep comments to about three minutes. But again, as normal, I I've got leeway from the chair to grant a little more time if you need some. Uh, and uh, we'll proceed. Mr. Cox, good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Members, City Manager. Give me just a second. So the item that you have before you is a request to rezone approximately 12 acres of land generally located at the corner of uh, FM 3009 and Ashley Oak. That's right here. Uh, the site has an existing um, assisted living uh, nursing home facility on it called Autumn Winds. Uh, they're requesting to rezone from its existing zoning of R4, which is apartment multifamily residential to a planned development district, and I'll go a little bit more into that as we go through this presentation. Uh, the, there was public hearing published in the San Antonio Express News on June 21st for this public hearing. Additionally, 65 public hearing notices were mailed out to surrounding property owners within 200 feet of the subject property on June 2nd prior to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Uh, at the time of this presentation, staff has received four responses in favor and two responses opposed and one neutral to the request. Uh, additionally, during the public hearing, uh, there were a couple folks who spoke. Um, for the most part, they were in favor of the project or neutral to the project and just had concerns with um, some drainage issues uh, that may be caused by future expansion, as well as on-street parking uh, along Ashley Oak. We have. Uh, forwarded the on-street parking issue to uh, TSAC for review, and I believe they are currently reviewing uh, that item for on-street parking. So the request is to rezone this uh, property to a planned development district. Uh, the planned development district will have the base zoning of R4, which is the same zoning that's on it currently, with a couple additions. Uh, the predominant changes will be that uh, it will the land uses will be modified to include assisted care and living facility, which is not currently allowed in the R4, uh, but would we? That, but staff feels is appropriate for this section. Additionally, they have requested to uh, modify some design requirements related to screening and buffering between non-residential or multifamily properties and single-family residential. Uh, currently, the Unified Development Code requires a. Uh, eight foot masonry wall uh, with a 20 foot wide landscape buffer that has uh, trees and shrubs planted in it at a ratio of one tree per linear feet for 30 linear feet of buffer and 10 shrubs per 50 linear feet. Uh, what they're proposing is to uh, do away with the masonry wall requirement and instead increase that buffer, double its size to 50 feet, and increase the planting requirement to one shade tree per 20 linear feet and uh, 15 shrubs per every 50 linear feet. Staff has, uh, also there's a number of trees. Let me go back one. This has some trees on it. Um, these are the areas that are bounded by existing residential. Uh, as you can see, there's a number of trees here as well. Some of this is to help preserve those trees. I'm not having an awkward wall there. Uh, staff has reviewed this with the applicant uh, and feels that that is an appropriate, um, an appropriate buffer that takes place and mitigates the issues and concerns that we would have for uh, expansion development adjacent to the single family residential by providing that larger buffer. They're buffering from noise site, um, which are the primary concerns with commercial being adjacent to residential. Uh, again, this PDD would specifically state, though, that that 
modification would only be allowed for the uh, assisted care and living facility land use. So if someone else, let's say an apartment complex in the future came in 20 years down the road, purchased this property, tore it down and redeveloped it, they would still have to put in that masonry wall because we would feel it would be appropriate at that point, assuming we still have that requirement 20 years down the road. Um, additionally, uh, this area is identified on the comprehensive land use plan as single family residential. The objectives of the single family residential designation uh, is for areas to be utilized as traditional neighborhood design, but it also include a mix of residential uses and some limited commercial development to support the daily activities of the development. And so again, we feel the staff feels that the zoning is appropriate as well because it does encapsulate uh, the multifamily, which is an existing zoning there, if at some point in time the property was to redevelop as that. Uh, however, the plans currently is for the expansion of the assisted care uh, nursing facility, um, which I will let the applicant discuss with you here in a little bit. Uh, as far as impacts on infrastructure and public facilities and services, this will have, this zoning has minimal impact on those as this is a uh, existing development and it has infrastructure already located in both 3009 and Ashley Oaks. Um, staff feels that this is a very compatible land use. Obviously it's existing today. It's been existing for many, many, many years along with the uh, surrounding residential land uses. Um, and they seem to mesh well together because it's a very low intensity commercial land use as opposed to having a retail strip center with a Starbucks in it or something like that right next to your house. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission forwarded a recommendation on June 14th after a public hearing of approval of this item by unanimous vote. Uh, city staff also recommends approval of this item as it is uh, consistent with the goals and objectives of the comprehensive land use plan and the existing land use conditions uh, surrounding it. The applicant is available if you have any questions and I believe they have a brief presentation. Uh, Mayor, if you'll allow that. Why don't we do this? I want to open up my public hearing um, and then have you go after the public hearing simply because if there are questions brought up by the public that would give you an opportunity to address those. That's all right. All right, so at this time, um, I'm going to open the public hearing. Anybody who would like to address the council on this matter uh, can come forward and do so. I'd ask you to state your name and address, if you would. Um, and um, again, you know, try to keep comments to around three minutes. But again, with the chair, I have an opportunity to just extend that if you need me to. Uh, so at this time, we'll open the public hearing. And anyone that would like to address the council on this matter can come forward at this time and do so. Bezus, 528 Wayward Pass. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, before a decision is made, and I just heard the gentleman says this is uh, unanimously approved by the city uh, planning and zoning and the city employees. Why don't you take a ride up there down that street in the morning before you make a decision and you find out that you cannot really exit nor sometimes enter uh, uh, Ashley Oak, and I've backed up quite a distance exiting my neighborhood because there is cars parked both sides that belong to the assisted living in both sides of the road. And I had to back up so somebody could come in from 3009 and continue their path into the neighborhood, exiting the same way. <clears throat> so let's assume this goes through. I don't know if, if, if those neighbors really thought it through, the people that built houses on that street, because they will become a sidewalk parking. I mean, there's cars parked in, in both directions. The wall is really a necessary thing if this get approved. But the question is, how are, are they gonna widen the road? Is somebody gonna widen the road? Where are they gonna park? Why there is parking in both sides where there is one vehicle will go through, one at a time. And just two days ago, uh, one of our police officers pulled a car over. There's two cars in front of me, I'm behind them. Everybody backed up so they could pull up, up to the side of the road. So you, you please look into that before 
this become a nightmare. Not only that, exiting already from Ashley Oak to 3009 is very difficult, very, very difficult, because traffic come in both sides. So if you're actually going north on, on, on 3009, you have a great chance of going, but if you're going south on 3009, you got a difficulty crossing that road. That light definitely does help for the damp, but I want you to look at that street because it's really becoming harder and harder to exit from and enter because of the cars that are parking. And every time I'm driving through, sometimes I go the other way, I'm like, I hope I get to the stop sign before I have to back up because it's appropriate for me to back up. Then somebody coming from 3009 and all of a sudden we stop head to head. So I want you all to think about that, please. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, sir. Anyone else that would like to address the council here during the public hearing? Does not look like I have any takers. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing at this time and invite the applicant to come up and uh, uh, perhaps address any of Mr. Azusa's questions and um, make any presentation you'd like to make. Mayor, City Council members, uh, Mr. City Manager, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present for a few minutes. I will try to make this a, a quick presentation, uh, but also want to provide you some information about what our plans are. We want to be very transparent in what we're doing. I uh, also want to address some of the questions that we've heard before and also that we just heard as well. Uh, hopefully our plan, we really believe, actually going to alleviate some of the issues that are there. Uh, we'll proactively address some of those uh, concerns on traffic on the street. So uh, at a very high level, very simple, uh, we, there is an existing nursing home there. It's been there for many years. We are planning to expand the existing facility by adding 30 private rooms. Uh, those rooms uh, will be nice first class. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of other developments uh, that we've done in the state so you get a good idea of kind of what the quality will be. Uh, in addition to the additional rooms that we're going to have, we're also going to be adding some additional therapy space, uh, new living space, new dining space. Those are things that are going to be benefiting all of the residents in, in the uh, facility. So uh, a majority of our residents are from shirts. This is something that we're going to be expanding the capacity, adding some additional jobs, but also pro providing a better uh, area for the existing residents as well, which is very important for us. In addition to that, we are adding additional 24 parking spaces. And I'm going to talk about the parking in just one second after I get through this slide. Um, additional conference room, walking paths, outdoor living space. space um, from an architectural plan and construction perspective, uh, I'm going to show you in just a second some of the site plans and uh, floor plans that we have. Uh, it does take about six months for us to complete those final plans. It'll be another generally uh, 12 months for construction. So this will take from now out uh, a couple of years to complete before we would be done with it. Um, we have also, in addition to the presentation at planning and zoning, we did have a uh, public information session for people who are within the radius um, and also residents and families um, in June as well so we could explain to people who are in the community and our neighbors what we're doing and try to be very again open about that. One of the things I want to specifically address on the parking is uh, we went out uh, on a day in very much like today in June and we actually counted out the parking spaces that are there and the number of cars that were on the street. Uh, on that given day there were 23 cars that were on Ashley Oaks. So, um, to address the, the, the issue that was brought up, it is absolutely an issue. One of the things that was brought up in PNZ, uh, not by us, but a lot of, there's other uh, businesses that are on that street, which I think actually, uh, do we contribute some to the street traffic? We might. I don't think it's majority um, our issue. On that same day we, that I counted 23 cars on the street, uh, we had 21 open uh, spaces in our parking lot. So some of what we're doing is we're not add, only adding, and I'll show you here in a second, um, 24 additional uh, parking spaces, but we're also uh, creating a circle drive that goes all the way around the building so it'll be easier for people to access our parking lot who are working there, who are visitors to, to, the, uh, to the facility, so visiting family members that are there, friends that are there. So right now what I've got on, the, on your screen is a, a site plan. Um, and what I've done is I've color coded this so that you can see in the light blue is the existing building. The dark blue is the addition. 
and then the drive, which is there, it's colored. You can see some additional. We're actually uh, bringing the drive around the back of the building, so we'll have better access for, um, for cars. So some of the issue is I think we've got a lot of spaces open there right now, but people don't have good access to it because it, uh, it goes out on the existing thoroughfare. So this will actually allow people to drive around the building for parking. It'll be easier access. and It'll be better for employees to get to kind of where they're going in the building. Uh, we're also adding the 24 spots. We are adding 30 residents, but our residents don't drive, so there's no additional cars there. Uh, we are going to be adding some employees. We think that we'll probably add uh, 10 to 15 employees, although at any given time, because we are a, uh, obviously, we've got staff that are there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. At any given time, we would have no more than nine additional sca staff that would be actually working at one time. So nine cars there, we'll have a few additional uh, families that'll be there, friends that'll be there, but generally we're adding additional parking spots uh, for what we're doing. Also increasing the, the access to the parking at the back of the building. So we think a lot of what we're doing is addressing the traffic that is on Ashley Oak. Um, so hopefully our plan helps that significantly. Uh, here is a, a floor plan. Again, I know this is small, but this is just to give you a feel coming off of the existing facility. Uh, in yellow are the resident rooms. Uh, 30 of them, they're all private. We're adding a brand new state-of-the-art therapy gym. That will be not only for these residents, but all the residents in the building. Additional dining space, some outdoor dining space, a new portico share uh, for entry. Some additional office space, conference room space. That'll be nice for residents and staff. Uh, this is an elevation of the building. It is one story, very importantly. Uh, it's gonna be uh, uh, all built, obviously, within code. Uh, it'll be a brick facility. Uh, with a pitched roof, it'll match very much the look and feel of the existing facility. So we're not trying to create something that's going to be um, completely different, although we want something that looks new. It's going to be a very nice first-class development that will tie in, we think, hopefully, seamlessly as possible as you can with the building as of the age of what we have currently. Uh, just a real high level quick uh, of the players. Uh, I am the president and CEO of Trinity Healthcare. Trinity Healthcare operates the facility. Um, Omega Healthcare Investors is the owner of the facility. Omega Healthcare Investors is a public reach. They own over about a thousand nursing homes in the country. The largest owner of nursing homes, very tenured uh, management team uh, based out of Baltimore, Maryland. They don't operate a single building. Uh, they lease it to operators like myself. Uh, Trinity Healthcare, we operate over 20 nursing homes in Texas, um, primarily in communities like Shirts. Uh, we're also in uh, Seguin as well. Um, and we've got, uh, again, a very experienced management team. We've been there for several years in the, at the facility, and we're really excited about the opportunity to expand what we have, make it better for our residents and our staff. Uh, I'm gonna show you some examples of uh, properties that Omega, again, who's the owners of the real estate, have built in Texas. Again, this is not gonna be representative of the style that we're doing, but you can see the quality of the product that's being built. Uh, this is a building that's in Eagle Lake. The architect of this building in Eagle Lake is the same architect that we're using for our expansion. Uh, so this was, the, this was the outside of the building, this is the interior of the building, resident rooms, courtyards, dining room space, you know, a beauty salon. This is a building in Capel, Texas. Uh, again, portico share, nurse's station, resident hallways, nice land, very nice landscaping. Here's a building in Round Rock. Again, uh, it's got some uh, therapy gym space. It'll be similar to what you're gonna see in our facility. Um, resident rooms, some, um, some additional beauty salon space. Building a mesquite. Again, very nice uh, outside uh, spa area, bathroom area, dining room space. So these will give you hopefully a, a feel for kind of the quality of what's being built uh, by Omega in the state of Texas. And that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, Council, just a little reminder, we are uh, considering an ordinance to uh, change zoning. Uh, anybody have any comments or, or questions for staff or for the applicant? Mr. Thompson. A couple of comments, not so much questions. Um, I believe the addition is going to be a welcome um, addition to a business that's got an excellent reputation in this community for decades. <clears throat> Having been there many times, I believe that your plan to connect the back, 
with an access road, if I can call it that, to the front parking lot, that's going to really help that front parking lot. It's been very difficult to get to. And as far as the, uh, the masonry wall, with the fact that the, most of the, uh, if not all of the surrounding homeowners already have a fence, as a residential homeowner, looking onto a 50-foot green space, that's nice. So I, I really think you've done some things well and thought through it, and I uh, believe it's going to be very positive. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Anyone else? Mr. Crawford? Sir, how many existing residents are there now? Uh, so it changes on a daily basis. We've got 80 residents there today. Okay. Uh, when, we, when we had the comments earlier about the parking issue, do we have any way of knowing how much of the street parking could be employees that work for the nursing home at this time? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but, but I just, from, from us looking at it, knowing that we've got, there was 20, that day, 23 cars on the street and we had 21 open parking spaces. Uh, I, I don't know how many people are our employees or, or people who are visiting the facility, but uh, I, I tend to think that it's a lot of people that are not only us, but some of the other businesses that are on the street. But with what you're adding, you should be able to adequately take care of all the employees who would be working at any given time and have enough room for residents. Yes, sir. Because the residents want to park. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. They, they, none I've of them been through cars, that myself, but... and it's important. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. For, for, Mr. for Bryce? Not to be wasting your time, but with respect to the trees, and it says one every 20 feet. Now, I don't remember all the rules from being in PNZ, but what if you wanted to plant a tree that was going to be, have a real big canopy, and you put them every 20 feet, you'd have a problem 10 years down the road or whatever. Can you, is that negotiable for them if they want to do something a little more um, beautification-wise, so to speak? Yes. So, so the way that that is enforced, it's not 20 feet on center. So we don't make all the trees line up. Again, there's um, 50 feet of proposed area, so they'll be staggered back and forth along that area, and they can cluster them as well, because trees don't generally grow in straight lines in nature unless you got a fence. Okay. Thank you. Council, anyone else? Mr. Davis? Uh, do we anticipate having a response from TSAC prior to the second reading? No, sir. T TSEC doesn't meet in July, so we're going to cover it with TSAC in August. Uh, a couple of things I would point out maybe that's helpful. My impression of the situation is that um, there are a number of businesses in the areas that are contributing. If you've driven past there, some of those medical office parking lots tend to be fairly jam-packed with people parking all over. So the impression one gets is that at least one of those is contributing heavily to that. Um, the other thing I'll say is, as Bryce kind of touched on real quick, the current use is not allowed under the present zoning, so it's a non-conforming use. So they don't have the ability to add additional parking under that current zoning. So one of the benefits I think that they talked about is with the approval of the zoning, they add the additional parking. I, I would say this is similar to maybe some of the issues we've dealt with when you were on TSAC and other locations. It really is a matter of sitting down with the different business owners and saying, hey, look, we're having a problem. Too many folks are parking on the street or they're parking in a way that's blocking traffic. And I think we can make some improvements by working with those folks um, as, as we go forward. Um, but in a nutshell, no, we, we don't meet till TSEC till July or August. Good. Anyone else? Dr. Kaiser? No, I was just going to move to approve Ordinance 17 S23. Second. I have a motion from Dr. Kaiser and a second from Mr. Thompson. Any other comments or questions from Council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, next item we have on the agenda this evening is item number 10, Ordinance 17A25, an ordinance by the City Council of City of Shirts confirming and approving a boundary agreement establishing the municipal boundary between the City of Shirts and the City of Cibolo and providing an effective date. So the item that you have before you, um, this ordinance and the agreement that goes with it is to adjust the boundary uh, between the city of Cibolo and the city of Schertz along the homestead development. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is an older photo of when it was still Nortex, uh, but this is the best color photo I could find that kind of illustrates the entire project as a whole. 
Um, so Homestead is master planned under its own plan development district. Uh, it encompasses approximately 667 acres between Schertz and Cibolo. Um, Schertz has about 433 of those acres and Cibolo has got the remainder 234. And so on this kind of overall concept, let me orient you, we've got I-35 here uh, with Homestead Parkway running down it. This black line is the existing city limit. Uh, and then this portion is the portion that is in within Cibolo. And so if you all have been out there any time recently, what you will have seen is uh, this pod here and this pod here. Uh, the roadway has been constructed in that. I believe they're building model homes now uh, out there as well. Uh, the city's accepted the first couple units of this. And so when this was originally conceptualized, one of the, one of the ideas that the developer had since the, this whole portion is their property, from about this area to this area along the city limit line was to come, it was to request a boundary adjustment from both Cibolo and Schertz to provide a more logical, easily navigable boundary by having it follow uh, this east-west collector road that they will be constructing as part of this project. Uh, so uh, city staff has sat down with the applicant as well as Cibolo city staff on multiple occasions to discuss this over the last several years. Uh, as, they, as the applicant is moving forward into, uh, sorry, as the homestead developer is moving forward into uh, starting to preliminary plat uh, these phases here, they wanted to make sure and see if the city would uh, agree to a boundary agreement to adjust this boundary. So a little bit more on the boundary agreement. Um, this is a graphic that was included in your packet. And again, to, I kind of swapped the picture. So 35 is towards the top of the page. Uh, Green Valley Road is going towards the bottom of the page. This is that east-west collector uh, that kind of runs through here with the roundabout as well. And so what was discussed between uh, the developer as well as city staffs was to have this roadway, have the roadway serve as the city limit. One of the difficulties with that is if you divide a road literally down the center line, we now have funny maintenance things where let's say an eastbound lane is maintained and a westbound lane may not be as well maintained or you get split maintenance. And so the solution that staff came up on this is to divide it by full sections of roadway. And so uh, city staff got with Cibolo city staff and identified what we feel is kind of an, a reasonable uh, equal split on this where the city of Schertz would be taking this portion here, which will serve this town home section development, which is within the city of Schertz currently, uh, and the city of Cibolo would be responsible and have into their city limits uh, the full roundabout as well as uh, the remaining portion of this which stubs to a little bit of ETJ property and ultimately will kind of service their development in uh, Cibolo more. And so the hard numbers that we're looking at on this uh, is that the city of Cibolo would be receiving approximately uh, just over one acre of land. These, these three areas that are defined by the little hash marks which are currently within the city of Schertz city limit. Uh, in turn, the uh, city of Schertz would be granted from Cibolo uh, almost nine and a half acres, which is the darker shaded areas here. Uh, the key thing on this is that there are no developable lots being transferred in this. So of that nine acres, uh, a good portion of it is the, uh, a private park and drainage open space that the Homestead HOA will be maintaining which takes up kind of this big chunk right here. Uh, it's part of their kind of linear park system and, and drainage features. Uh, additionally, there is a little bit of frontage um, along this townhome concept. Again, that hasn't been uh, kind of vetted out any more than what you see here, so we don't know what any potential layouts would be or things like that. Uh, the current developer does predominantly detach single family residential development, so it may be a different party that comes in to develop that later, or they may team up with somebody Um, so again, just to kind of to, to clarify, city staff is, uh, does recommend a, approval of this ordinance and then subsequent uh, signing of the boundary adjustment agreement. This item is also concurrently being heard at uh, Cibolo City Council this evening. Um, and so we do have a representative uh, from the developer who is available to answer any specific questions if you all have things. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you'll have on this. Very good. Thank you, sir. Council, questions for Mr. Cox? Mr. Gutierrez? I have a question. If I'm looking at this map correctly, 
if I'm on the right hand side over here I live in Civilo but the road is maintained by shirts and on the opposite side I live in shirts but the road is maintained by Civilo isn't that a little backwards so we so so there are portions so there's portions of both shirts and Civilo uh, accessing this collector the nice part is no one fronts on the roadway so there's no current lots other than this townhome section that may possibly front on the roadway. Uh, these pods have access, but again, it's a collector class street. And so there's nobody who's going to have a driveway directly fronting that from Cibolo or shirts on any of the detached home products. So these are the back, backs of the houses? Be the backs of the houses that would front there. So again, all of this row in Cibolo would be fronting this street here. Uh, these shirts lots will front onto the inside of this pod. There's a, a connection here that goes all the way across between the two. Um, the same down here, we've got a connection, uh, but no frontage, no direct frontage. And then these are side lots and rears of lots here. Um, the townhome product could possibly front onto the collector. Generally what's done on that though is some kind of slip street or uh, a road going through it so they can maximize the area because those are often a much denser, tighter product. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there a motion to approve Ordinance 17-825? So move. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson. I have a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Thanks, Thank sir. you. Item number 11, Resolution 17-R50, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing and approving a one-year extension to the call to the on-call engineering services master agreement with Cobb, Finley, and Associates Incorporated and all matters in connection therewith. Evening, Ms. Woodley. Good evening again. Um, so this resolution, as well as um, 17R 5250, uh, 51, 52, and 53, are all for the four on-call consulting firms that we hired three years ago to provide engineering services for us without having to go through the RFQ process for every single project for which we needed uh, engineering services. We've been successful with each one of the firms and the way the agreement was written, it allows for council to authorize an, an extension of one year twice for each firm. We see no reason to change midstream and um, we request authorization to continue with the same on-call firms. Very good, thank you. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Woodley? Mr. Larson? Um, so these are the same unedited agreements simply being re, so there's not any rate changes or updates to it, just the same exact terms, just look for resigning. Same terms, same unit rates. All right. Mr. Crawford? Are we looking at one at a time or all four of them together? We have to do them one at a time. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Woodley? Mr. Crawford? You may not know the answer, but do we know how how far we are how far we are along in the dollar amounts spent up to this point versus what it would be in a total, or do we even have totals at this point? Uh, I don't have the total dollar amounts. Each one of the firms has worked on a variety of projects. Okay. Some of them are okay. still working on. Well, each one is currently working on at least one project. Right. Okay. That, that was mentioned in the in the documents. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Council. Anyone else? If not, is there a motion to approve Resolution 17-R50? So move. Second. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson. My right ear has less hearing loss. Second by Mr. Gutierrez. Um, any other comments or questions for Council? Then I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Next item is item 12, resolution 17R51, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing and approving a one-year extension on the on-call engineering services master agreement with Ford Engineering Incorporated in all matters in connection therewith. There's no changes to the uh, uh, to this one as to the previous one. Is there a motion to approve 17R51? No moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Larson, a second by Mr. Thompson. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. Motion carries. Item number 13, resolution 17R52, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing and approving a one-year extension on the on-call engineering services master agreement with Lockwood, Andrews, and Newnham, Incorporated in all matters in connection therewith. Is there a motion to approve 17R52? So, so move. I have okay. a motion from um, 
Mr. Crawford, if I'm not mistaken. I have a second for Mr. Thompson. Is that correct? Correct. All right, very good. Um, if there's no other comments or questions, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. Motion carries. Item number 14, 17R53, resolution 17R53, resolution by the City Council of the City of Church, Texas, authorizing and approving a one-year extension to the on-call engineering services master agreement with Pape Dawson Engineers Incorporated and all matters in connection therewith. Is there a motion to approve 17R53? So move. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson, a second from Mr. Gutierrez. Any other comments or questions from Council? Not I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays, the motion carries. Item number 15, Ordinance 17T26, an ordinance by the City Council of City of Church, Texas, authorizing a budget amendment. Hang on. An ordinance by the City Council of the City of Church, Texas, authorizing a budget, budget amendment fund additional to fund additional contract inspection services to provide funding for the Church Housing Authority, to provide funding for a stone monument sign and for EMS community support services repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance and providing an effective date. Good evening, Mr. Walters. Good evening. Uh, tonight we have a few budget adjustment items for council to consider, two in the general fund, one in the EMS fund, and one in the uh, parkland dedication fund. Uh, the city staff usually comes to council for a budget adjustment. Either it's a uh, large budget adjustment towards the end of the year to kind of get accounts in line for the end of the year uh, so we can stay under um, what council has approved previously and be in line with the state statutes requiring us to have a budget and to follow it um, under this um, um, I have the statute uh, subtitle a uh, section 10209 um, with that the majority of uh, cities and councils in the area usually do like an end of the year kind of wrap up to um, adjust anything that looks out of whack. Um, I had a chance at the last uh, TML legislative update to confer with a budget analyst out of Austin. Um, they do sort of the same thing where they allow certain areas to go over budget during the year as long as they stay within budget for the overall department. And then if it looks like the department as a whole won't be able to meet that, then they go to council and ask for a budget adjustment. Our practices in the past have been relatively the same thing. Uh, we come to council if there is a large sort of one-time uh, style of uh, project that comes up not in the original budget. Um, usually it's a significant in nature and it's like a grant award. So we didn't know if we'd get it. We weren't going to proceed with the project without the grant. So we waited until we had a confirmation that the grant was there and funded. We come to council for a budget adjustment at that point. Um, the other type is we um, sort of a, we try to continue our services best we can. We look a little bit high in the beginning. We're not sure if that's a trend or if we're going to cool down the rest of the year. Um, when those items kind of become apparent towards the second half of the year, uh, staff has tried to pull as many of those type of items together at once at one time for ease of council use and uh, digest and, and approve those at once. Um, we'll probably going forward look for um, two of those, roughly two of those a year towards the end of the year, the second two quarters going forward, try to wrap a bunch of these items that um, may or may not uh, go over budget by the end of the year, but certainly look very promising that they will do that. Um, we also um, always try to have the budget balanced first and foremost by revenues. So if we see a revenue that's coming in over budget and we need a budget adjustment that's linked to that, We'll try to recognize that additional revenue, offset that expense. The bottom line that we had presented in the original budget does not change, and that was our goal. Um, if that doesn't work, there's no excess revenues for us to tap. We look between departments to see if there were savings in one that we could use in another department. Um, that way we're not asking council to authorize additional funding and potentially take more funds out of fund balance at that point. Um, the third and final option that we go to as a last resort, um, we look like it's a significant Expense, there's no additional revenues we can tap, and it doesn't look like there's room elsewhere in the budget. In that case, we'd probably ask council to take funds from fund balance to cover that. Um, those are very rare circumstances in that last one. We always um, prioritize balancing the budget first and foremost. That's in more of a catastrophic recession coming up out of nowhere kind of situation. Um, uh, if council has any specific questions over any of the items that uh, uh, the budget adjustment was for, we have to answer and we have representatives here available as well. Thank you, sir. 
Anybody have any questions for Mr. Walters? If not, is there a motion to approve Ordinance 17 T26? So move. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson, a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from Council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda this evening is item 16, resolution 17 R49, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing an interlocal agreement with the Shirts Housing Authority and other matters in connection therewith. Mr. James. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, you may recall at the last meeting we had a work session item where we discussed uh, providing some funding to the Shirts Housing Authority as we've done to some other nonprofits. The direction was for staff to come back with $5,000 provided for the Shirts Housing Authority. Uh, we've done that. The 5000 would go to them immediately, if you will, uh, upon entering an interlocal agreement. And then we would roll 5000 into the budget for next year as well and then ongoing years as, as much as Council desires. Um, the resolution you approve allows us to staff, essentially staff the city attorney to work with the housing authority to draft that interlocal agreement. Uh, we would then, the city manager and the director would execute that and then the funds would be provided. As I indicate in the staff report, rather than really get into their business of how they use, telling them how to use the money, uh, what we'll do is include reporting requirements where they can come back, uh, indicate what services they've provided over the course of the year, generally how they've used money, and council can really respond to that. And we think that gives them more flexibility going forward and keeps the appropriate relationship, much as you do with some of those other agencies that provide updates. So with that, staff recommends approval of the resolution. Thank you, sir. Any comments or questions from council? I'll make a comment. It's probably something we should have done a long time ago is uh, help out uh, our Shirts Housing Authority. They provide an essential service uh, here in the city, uh, and I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Davis bringing this idea forward to us. Uh, is there a motion to approve Resolution 17R49? Eric Carpenter. Yes, sir. Since Mr. Davis did take the lead in this, I believe it should be his privilege and honor to approve. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Davis, a second from Dr. Kaiser. Any other comments or questions from Council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. All right, item number 17, seven, uh, excuse, 17 is resolution 17, R56, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, yeah. authorizing a contract with BB Inspections for inspection and plan review services and expenditures with BB Inspections totaling no more than $180,000 for building inspection services through the remainder of FY 2016-2017 and no more than $180,000 for fiscal year 2017 to 2018 and other matters in connection therewith. Thank you, James. Mayor. Uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Wood and I will tag team on this one, and certainly we can see how much information that City Council would like. Uh, some of this we gave some background information in this staff report and then the budget adjustment staff report. Um, but essentially what we're doing, and, and certainly in the staff report, I tried to take responsibility where I erred on this one. Um, this item, and, and to answer some questions, this item was really prompted when the contract for temporary services came forward. There were some questions about that. We went back and looked at all of our contracts. When asked about it, my initial reaction is, no, we came back with B&B last summer. I think we're in good shape. And certainly upon looking at it, what we came back was not what I had thought it was. It was not what I described during the council meeting. Uh, and I certainly erred on that. And so what we're looking to do is come back and make that correction to continue to operate as we have been. Uh, I don't want to steal Ms. Wood's thunder, but essentially what we did a, starting a couple years ago is there was a lot of frustration on the part of the development community, residents, et cetera, because we had some significant fluctuations in the wait times for permits to be issued and inspections to be conducted. Uh, and that was in large part due to fluctuations in the permit volume that we had, the number of permits that would come in, and staffing issues that would occur, where we were short-staffed, where we had an issue that was going on. And so essentially when we talked to City Council with the update to the building code a couple of years ago, we keyed on a couple of things that were, that were important for us. First and foremost, we were not going to let the quality of plan review or the quality of the inspection drop. Uh, I think a natural kind of tendency at times when you get busy is you start skimming through stuff. And because of certainly some issues we've seen in other communities, certainly issues we've seen in this community, it's critical that we take the time we need to do a, a, a thorough, diligent plan review and inspection to avoid problems down the road. 
That unfortunately means something else has to give, and often what gave was that time frame that it took to do plan review. And when we did the building code update, we heard a lot of the residential home builders lamenting the fact that it was taking significant amounts of times, a month and a half, to get a single family residential home set of plans approved, some of the costs associated with that, et cetera. And we described how we had, were going and using some contract firms, and initially we used three to help supplement staff time. Uh, we've really kind of primarily used two. Again, I'm sort of stealing Lisa's thunder, uh, but primarily because of the fact that our permit volume this year has gone up, single family, as well as some large major, I'll let you get to and you can just do a better <laughs> job than what I've said. But some big projects that really eat up our staff time in terms of schools that come forward, and the fact that, frankly, we've lost significant staff time due to uh, medical leave. Uh, we've relied on those more hand to keep the, those plans moving through in a timely manner. But I will say this, that fundamentally, our, our goal is probably always to use to some level contract services, because the way our inspection process works is if you call that inspection in or email that inspection in now on the improvements we made by 6 a.m., we're going to try to get to that inspection that day. So literally when the inspection staff shows up in the morning starting to show up and pull in that list of inspections, they find out I got 40, I got 50, or at times over 100 inspections that day. At that point they look at it depending on what those inspections are. They need help to make those inspections happen. We use BNB and use them significantly because they have the capacity to essentially say, if you've got 25 or 30 inspections, we will get them done for you today and we will have our folks out there as late as it takes generally to get those inspections done. That is all the more critical because often that inspection that's requested has to happen in order for something else to occur. So a framing a foundation inspection, a pre-pour inspection has to occur in order for the concrete that's already been ordered and paid for to be poured the next morning, likely first thing at 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. if we do an early release or 7 a.m. if there's not. And so that's part of why we do it. But again, at this point, I'll be quiet. Let Lisa kind of walk you through in a bit more detail if you'd like it uh, as to why we're doing this and how that fits in our system of not reducing the quality of plan review or inspection and having a more consistent time frame so folks know what to expect when they walk in and say, how long will this take you to get this through the process? So I'll quickly... Mayor, Council, thank you for having us here. So quickly go through, um, you know, some of the goals of these contracted services and, and the department is to provide that quality plan review and inspection. And so through that, our goal has been to work on staff training. Um, we've, we've got staff members. We have uh, one new one who has gotten four new ICC certifications, and one of those is a plans examiner certification. And we also have all four of our inspectors who are licensed plumbing, exam, uh, plumbing inspectors now. Um, to manage the peaks and valleys of our workload, um, our goal is uh, to use these contract plan review and inspection services. You know, we've eliminated the uh, shed and fence permits, and within the next couple of months, I'll come through and request to potentially eliminate garage sale permits as well um, for just kind of to, for the future. And then we've made some process improvements. We've made some pro improvements to our checklists. Um, we meet with contractors monthly, regularly. Um, we make special meets in the field with them to help them through. And then we also meet with the Greater, uh, uh, Greater San Antonio Building Associations to help us work through some of those things. So part of the background was, as Brian mentioned, and, and maybe I don't need to go through all of this because it's in the report and he mentioned it, but we did meet with council to uh, work through building code updates and part of those discussions had to do with uh, building time frames. Uh, they were taking a very long time and we've actually gotten those down based on some of the help that we've had. And at that time in July 2015 we entered into contracts or agreements with BNB inspections, Rudy Cantu and ATS engineering inspectors and uh, surveyors to perform those inspections and plan reviews. And they actually helped bring down the time frames tremendously. Um, to provide that quality of service for our residents and our um, developers that come in. And then in June 2016, as Brian mentioned, um, we requested an increase. And then I meant, I'll mention it again, the, we eliminated the, the shed permits. So our, our goal in inspections is that somebody who requests an inspection by 6 a.m. receives that inspection that day, which is typically sometimes less than 24 hours most of the time. Occasionally, if somebody you know does it the day before, um, 
and we have done well with that by using these contracted services. Um, also, we, we typically re receive anywhere from 40 to 80 inspections a day, um, and our inspectors um, typically take out more inspections than and try to do as many of the, as they can. They typically are, spend a little bit of time after five doing those to help our homeowners out. And we also prioritize our homeowners to get, um, they get the service that they need and then sometimes other folks have to be worked in so that our homeowners, when they're waiting at home for us to get there to do the inspections, we show up on time to be able to do that for them and they don't have to take off work and do those things extra time. The one thing that our inspectors don't have right now, we don't have someone licensed to perform medical gas inspections, and that was one of the things that the contracted services were doing for us. Um, there's a special certification for that, and, and the four inspectors that we have, none of them have that certification. Um, this is just a picture of our uh, plan review whiteboards. Uh, this is actually what it looked like at probably about 2 o'clock, but it does not look like that anymore. Um, we have um, on the left is our commercial plan review board and on the right is our residential plan review board and we actually have some extra spaces for commercial at the bottom because sometimes we fill up two boards. Um, on that we have 13 commercial plans under review. We have five commercial plans that are ready for pickup and then just to kind of go into the complex projects, I kind of just wanted to give you perspective on what type of projects that we have in, in commercial. So some of those commercial projects that I mentioned to you were, as you can see, this tightly rolled eight inch um, set of plans that is the remodel for the, one of the uh, schools, um, Clemens High School. And then next to it, you've got a, you know, probably a one inch size plans. And so there's a, a big variety of the size of plans that we do. And right now, uh, we have four very complex um, projects in the office. Uh, we actually issued the permit today for the Clemens remodel. Um, I'll get to a little bit of the revenues later, but um, so with that, the inspections will follow for the next probably, tw I think they told us it was going to be about a 30 month project and we're a few months in. Um, so currently, um, as in the staff report um, that was written, there are, as of June 30th, there were 200 and um, 86 single family residential permits through June um, through June uh, 30th. However, um, as of today, um, we but we were gone 4th of July, and so we're about four days into the work, four or five days into the work. We now have uh, issued 302, so 16 more uh, single family residentials. We have from 36, we have 40 residential plans under review and then not included in that 40 we have 12 that are approved and ready for pickup um, and just just to kind of point out that at, on that each home has a minimum of 22 inspections depending on if they get a pool or a deck or something that comes later um, additionally uh, on the plan review one of the things that we've done to uh, assist uh, the developers and the builders out there is we started to um, allow them to bring in smaller plans, um, which makes it a little bit more difficult for us. Um, but uh, as you can see, the smaller plans are 11 by 17, and there's a two different. So it does it, it does at times is a challenge, but it's definitely been a big help to the builders. And so um, that's what we've been working for is to to try to help them through the process as quickly as possible. So. Um, as you can see, here's kind of a graphical chart of what's been happening over the last three years. Um, at this same time, um, in 2014-15, we had issued 276 building permits, a residential, single family residential. Last year, we had issued 203, and this year, it says 286, but as of today, it's 302. Um, you know, some of the challenges Brian had mentioned is we've had uh, two staff members that have been out on medical leave. Um, that's more than 650 man hours that um, they've been out with personal leave and family leave um, through this, this actual budget year, which has been a real challenge for us to, to get all the work done and the inspections performed. Um, 
And then one of the things I wanted to mention too is, as our inspectors actually, they, they their jobs are, are ha hazardous jobs. We had just a couple of weeks ago at one of the inspections, something fell on one of the gentlemen and we had to take him. And so, you know, those, those types of things um, come into play when it comes to these inspections and what needs to be performed. So that took him out for a day of all the schedule that he had to do. And that uh, third party inspector was able to pick up those extra inspections for us. So just to, just to uh, summarize, in the revenues themselves, um, what I've provided you here is uh, the planning and community development permit licensing and uh, fee revenues. And what you'll see is um, the three years, the last three years. And as part of that, uh, the years for FY 14, 15, and 15, 16 um, are full year. And the green here is our current year, and that's through the first uh, three quarters of the year. So we still have another quarter to go. And today we issued the Clemens permit, which was um, another $500,000 permit. Um, so our revenues, I had written it down here. Is that yours? Yeah. Um, I had written down here to kind of just quickly summarize the difference between the two of any, uh, or the the amounts there if anybody's interested from this year to uh, the previous years. So right now we're up uh, $560,947 in revenue, not including the $500,000 permit that we issued today. So a million dollars um, from last year. And um, so SAC, uh, staff is seeking approval for a 15 month contract not to exceed the 180,000 per fiscal year for the balance of this year and all of next year. And to be clear, with regard to, to, to next year uh, particularly, our hope is not to use that much in contract services. We hope not to have our folks out on medical leave. Um, we want to continue to make some process improvements to try to gain some efficiencies. Again, the fact now that we have four inspectors that can do those plumbing inspections gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we use them. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, because our goal is if you call in for that inspection by six, we're going to try to get you. We're, we're likely going to continue to use B&B. But again, as we gain efficiencies at staff level, as we get more training, we will bring that dollar figure down. But our goal was to come in and say, let's ask for the dollar figure at the top end. If we can bring it in lower and maintain the appropriate level of service, that is our goal. Uh, I will say with regard to the contract, we may want to look back at the um, scope of services a little bit and tweak slightly. And then because this is a 15-month contract, we want to, the city attorney recommended we add some language just to cover to be clear that uh, for next year, if funds aren't available, then obviously we wouldn't utilize the services going forward. But um, again, the error in terms of not bringing this before is on me. I, I, I dropped the ball on that and thought I had previously, and I apologize for that, and, and certainly will answer any questions. Very good. Yeah, you know, a variable cost model makes the most sense for a variable need. Obviously, you look at the chart. Some years were up a bit more, down, up. Complexity varies. Uh, it just it makes a lot of sense from a cost perspective. We're, we're not. If we tried to staff for this, then the times when we're down or we have less complex, then we're maintaining a staffing level that's above the need. Uh, this lets us stay at the need, so it makes a lot of sense. It's good stuff. Council questions, Mr. Thompson. Comment, not so much a question. Years ago, I read a personal development personal development book called Fall Forward. Is the idea that all of us are going to mistakes um, made, all of us are going to have oversights, things are going to slip through the cracks, but how we handle them makes all the difference. Do we move forward because of them or move backwards? I, I would like, in a manner of speaking, our council to establish an atmosphere where these aren't the right words, but we honor and celebrate staff mistakes. We are growing, we're expanding, we're doing a lot of things. Staff is doing a great job. Some things have slipped through the cracks because it's being short staff. But I commend the city staff for bringing these forward, for owning up to them, and most importantly, for finding a way through them in the future. And so uh, I, I would kind of like to establish that mentality of honoring the following forward. And uh, I would move that we adopt resolution number 17 R56. Mayor. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson. I have a second from uh, Dr. Kaiser. I believe I heard Mr. Crawford. 
Out of curiosity, Brian. Yes, sir. How much was budgeted for BNB this fiscal year? We budgeted, I believe, eighty thousand dollars for contract services is what we budgeted for contract. And then very often, as James kind of talked about, normally when we're short staffed, it's because we have vacancies and we shift money over. So we budgeted eighty thousand total. I think we've used about fourteen thousand with Rudy Cantu yes. so far this year, who does the plan review. And again, we've not used ATS because they were not able to do a quick turnaround. They said we really need two or three days notice. <clears throat> the problem is I would have to guess and I couldn't guess. So the total budget for inspection fees or for inspection services from the from the contractor was eighty thousand. It was eighty thousand, yes. And we came back in June and approved up to ninety five, is that correct? No, sir. It do? was it's eighty thousand in the current fiscal year budget. We came back in June of last fiscal year and upped it to ninety five thousand, okay. I think is what we upped it to. So now we're ask now you're asking that we approve spending hundred and eighty thousand for fiscal Sixteen, seventeen. So that's an increase of hundred thousand, ninety five, ninety thousand. That's about it's about a ninety thousand. It's about a doubling of the increase. Okay. So that's that's, and that's justifiable because of the revenue generated by the inspection fees. I'm sure. I think it's justifiable because of the volume of yeah. yeah no, I understand. Up. The revenue is there to pay for it. And again, our goal has been not to do a lesser quality plan review or inspection and to keep the time frames consistent. And you're also asking us to approve a 17-18 budget issue, and it's not 17-18 yet. That's right. The idea is to, we're not asking for a budget issuance. We're asking that the contract, since we're be, be, be July, available to be extended to that amount. Let's do a 15-month approving that same dollar figure. Our hope, though, is because of we hopefully won't have those staff out because of the training we've done, some efficiencies. We won't need them as much. Also, unless some, some things change with regard to the timing of a couple high schools and a couple districts and the location, I don't think we're going to have that complex school plans coming in. We, we always have some smaller ones. But if the complexity of those commercial go down, then I won't need to use as much as that services. But it effectively says, let's not repeat this. Give me that flexibility, but we're going to work to keep it down as much as we can um, and not waste those dollars effectively. Thank you. Anyone else? Not as there. Well, I had a motion and a second. If nothing else, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is a roll call vote confirmation. Ms. Schmeckel. Consent items one, two, three, four, and five. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item six, ordinance number 17S21, final reading. Motion was made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item number seven, resolution 17R47. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item eight, resolution 17R48. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item nine, ordinance number 17S23, first reading. Motion made by Council Member Kaiser, seconded by Council Member Thompson. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 10, ordinance number 17A25, first reading. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. 11, resolution number 17R50. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Gutierrez. 
Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 12, Resolution 17R51. Motion made by Council Member Larson, seconded by Council Member Thompson. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 13, Resolution 17R52. Motion made by Council Member Crawford, seconded by Council Member Thompson. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 14, Resolution 17R53. Co motion was made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Gutierrez. Motion, I mean, I'm sorry. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 15, Ordinance 17T26, first reading. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 16, Resolution 17R49. Motion was made by Council Member Davis, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item 17, Resolution 17R56. Motion made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Kaiser. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Very good, thank you, ma'am. Um, this evening we do have a need for two closed sessions. Uh, the City Council will meet in closed session under Section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code, Pub personnel matters to deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of the City Manager. And number 19, City Council will meet in closed session under Section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code, personnel matters to deliberate the appointment of a municipal judge. So we will take about a five minute recess and um, then we will go into closed session. We'll conduct the business that we have before us as quickly as we can, and we'll get back out here and uh, re-enter open session. the spirit of the room. Um, next items that we have on the agenda, we will now go back into open session. Next items that we have on the agenda, we have item 18A, which is take any action based on the discussions held in closed session under agenda item 18. And I've made a note and I think I've captured the sentiment of the council and move that we retain the services of the city manager through June of 2018, at which time we will conduct his next annual review. And we will continue to work on our engagement with him and our organization as we go. So move. That was a motion from the chair. I'm looking for a second. I, it's late. Thank you. No problem. I have a motion from the chair and a second from Mr. Thompson. Any other discussion or commentary from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. Aye. Nay. Nay. Aye. Aye. I believe I have four ayes and two nays. Motion carries. Who, who are the nays? Um, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Davis.
All right, uh, next item is uh, item number 19A, take any action based on discussions held in closed session under agenda item 19. We have no action to take this evening, but we'll uh, take this up again in two weeks. And uh, next we have a roll call vote confirmation. Mr. Schmeckel. Item 18A, uh, action is to, a motion was made by the, uh, Mayor Carpenter seconded by council member Thompson to retain the services of the city manager for another year and do valuation in 2018. Council member Davis voted no. Council member Gutierrez voted yes. Council Larson voted yes. Thompson voted yes. Kaiser voted yes. And Council Member Crawford voted no. Motion passed. Thank you, ma'am. Next item that we have on the agenda this evening, we have announcements by the city manager. Do you have anything further, Mr. Kessel? Uh, item number 21, placing items on a future agenda. Uh, do we have anything that we need to schedule at a future meeting that we don't currently have? Hearing nothing, I'll move on to announcements by the mayor and council members, and I'll start with Mr. Crawford, as the mayor pro tem is not here. Mr. Crawford? Nothing. Mr. Davis? Nothing, sir. Mr. Gutierrez? Nothing. Mr. Larson? Nothing. Mr. Thompson? Nothing. Dr. Kaiser? Nothing. I will say that um, I thoroughly enjoyed the uh, fourth Jubilee. We got lots of great feedback. I think the staff did a fantastic job uh, putting on a an event that's been held in the city for uh, uh, more than 40 years. Uh, and we did it in a, with a different organization, and I think it came off well. Again, compliments to staff. I appreciate it very much. If there's nothing else from staff or from council, then we stand adjourned. Yes, don't forget we have the Main Street Committee meeting.